welcome back to my channel. As you can probably tell by the title, today's video is going to be my personal guide to where to start with Stephen King books if it's something that you're interested in getting into or if you just want to try and read one of his books to see if he is an author that you think that you could get along with writing wise then here is my guide. I have decided to do this in a way that I have essentially five books based off of five different categories or five different prompts which obviously I'll explain throughout the video and then I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the book and then tell you why I think that it would be a good book to start with. If you haven't seen my other video that I made about Stephen King so far, this is going to be a bit of a series hopefully on my channel. I thought that this was a good second video to make. The first video that I did to do with Stephen King books was essentially just an inventory of all the books that I have read by him so far, which is about 20 something. I've read you know, at least like 35 to 40% of his bigger works that are out at the moment. Let's, let's just get into the video, I think. It's probably the best way to do this. <laughs> One of the obvious ways to start with Stephen King is to start from the beginning. I think that's what a lot of people do with certain authors. It's maybe not the most accessible way to do it if you're someone that only wants to read a couple of his books bearing in mind that he's published so many books so therefore it will take you a while if you're thinking of reading them chronologically I have a friend that's doing that I don't know why <laughs> she hasn't read any Stephen King books or she she hadn't until the point where she decided she wanted to read them from the beginning so far she's gotten through the first two books I think I'm not sure if she's she's read the third book yet it's definitely a way you can go about it and obviously if that's how you want to do it, if you just want to go straight in with his first published novel, then obviously you're going to want to pick up Carrie, which was his first published novel. This book was first published in 1974 and in this we are following our main character, Carrie White, who has grown up in an extremely religious family to the point where when she experiences her first period, she doesn't actually know what's going on. It's a really traumatising experience for her because she doesn't actually know what's happening. So obviously, as you can imagine, to start bleeding like that is very scary. The reason that she doesn't understand what's happening is because of the religious aspects of her family and the idea that is sort of tied to religion, the idea of anything to do with becoming a woman being dirty or a taboo topic so therefore her mother has never introduced the idea to her, has never spoken to her about it. At the same time because she's grown up in this really religious family she's kind of ostracised by her peers, they don't understand it, they kind of think she's just a bit of a freak. Things have happened throughout her childhood which no one has been able to explain, just really odd phenomenon and uh, circumstances that no one has been able to explain thus far and when we meet Carrie and when we're following her throughout the story she actually has this sort of breakthrough moment of realising that she has these telekinetic powers which potentially could explain all the stuff that she has experienced as a child. That is essentially where the story leaves off and <laughs> we find out that she's got these powers alongside the, the fact that she's finding out about it for the first time she, as I said, goes through quite a bit of trauma with regards to having her first period. There's just in general a theme of blood running through it. If you know, if you've heard about Carrie, there's one scene that's particularly prominent in people's minds when it comes to Carrie, which also deals with blood. And it's just essentially following the aftermath and the fallout from her finding out about these powers as well as being ostracised by her peers, having an extremely strict religious mother and her sort of coming into herself and finding out how to own these powers and we're just following what happens after that. I would recommend this book, as I said, if you want to start from the beginning, that's the obvious one. If you are planning on reading a lot of his works, then for sure you might as well start from the beginning because if you want to experience his works chronologically and see how he has evolved as a writer then it's a really great idea. Obviously he has written a lot of works so you have to bear in mind that this is almost something that you have to 
dedicate a part of yourself to. Obviously it depends who you are, how much time you've got in order to be able to spend time reading all his works, but definitely if that's something you're interested in, obviously start with Carrie because it is his first work. As I said, another positive of this is that you can experience his writing evolving and also the themes, seeing like how themes change throughout his books. That's a really interesting point to take into consideration. It's also a very, very easy book to read in comparison to a lot of his other works later on, or not even that much later, he starts getting into writing the really chunky books. And if you don't like big books, then Carrie would definitely be a better place to start. As you can see, it's relatively short. It's about 200 pages. And it's also written in a way that's quite accessible and easy, easy to read. However, I would say that the downfall of this book is naturally because it is his first one, it's not as well written as some of his other works. <laughs> Whilst this is definitely a cult classic, it's definitely one of his most spoken about works. Writing wise, it's naturally not his best because it was his first published one. However, that is not to say this isn't a good story. This is a great story. I know that it's not everyone's favourite, but for the themes and for the fact that it is such a cultural phenomenon, I would definitely recommend starting with this. In particular, if you wanted to start sort of with something easy, something from the beginning of his career, then definitely go with Carrie. For the next book, I have decided to go with a cult classic. So if you want to go with something that everyone talks about, a lot of people would say that this is their favourite Stephen King book. A lot of people would also say that the movie adaptation is one of their favourite movies of all time. Of course, I am talking about The Shining. It's definitely one of his most well-known, if not his most well-known book that he's ever published. Again, this is one of his earlier works. However, it is so much better than Carrie. I'm actually due a reread of this because I haven't read it for a couple of years but I really definitely want to. I know that there's so many people that say it's their favourite. Spoopy Hole here on YouTube says that this is her favourite Stephen King ever. So people love this book. First published in 1977, The Shining is set in Colorado in the 1970s and it follows the Torrance family. The Torrance family is comprised of the father, Jack Torrance, who is a struggling writer. He was also a teacher, I believe, that was fired due to alcohol abuse. And then there's also the mother or Jack's wife, Wendy. We've also got a very sweet little five-year-old son, Danny Torrance, who throughout the story finds out that he has got, he possesses this ability called the shining, which only few people have. And it means that he experiences and can see things that a lot of people cannot see. At the beginning of this novel, we see the family going to the Overlook Hotel where Jack has been offered a job to be a caretaker for the hotel in its off season. This is a very remote hotel, so as you can imagine, we've got that kind of desolate, remote, very atmospheric feeling to it. We've got a third person narrator who is shifting perspectives between the different characters and one of the most interesting perspectives is that of Danny because he's got this shining also because he's a five-year-old kid he's got obviously a lot of fear and anxiety that he can't explain because at that age you don't really understand it and something that Stephen King really does very well in this book but also in lots of his other stories is writing from the perspective of children despite the fact that he was 100% an adult while he was writing this and now he's obviously in his 70s, he still continues to be able to write really good children characters. There's something about the way he writes children that is just very captivating and feels very true to life. The thing that I would say this book has going for it is it's very strong themes throughout. It is a prime example of something that I think Stephen King does really well, which is mixing everyday horrors. For example, in this book, we've got a strong theme of alcoholism with Jack Torrance being a bit of a raging alcoholic, <laughs> to be honest. At the same time, he mixes in those paranormal, the sort of imaginative horrors that children in particular experience, which is why it's really nice to get the perspective of Danny. At the same time, as I said, we've got paranormal. We've also got a lot of paranoia coming from, in particular, Jack's perspective. He is very paranoid about things happening. He also starts experiencing 
things, seeing things happen that he can't quite explain as a natural phenomenon. He doesn't want to believe that it could be paranormal at the same time, it seems like that is potentially one of the only solutions to what he is seeing. So we've got a lot of paranoia coming from his side. Something else that it's got going for it is it's got relatively short chapters. It's also, in my opinion, it hits the sweet spot of how long it is. I think Stephen King should start writing more books that are in this sort of bracket of being around 500 pages because we've got enough time to watch the characters develop and learn about them and come to know them a bit more. At the same time, it doesn't feel long-winded, it doesn't feel like it drags on like maybe some of his other books do. So I really enjoyed the length of this novel. I think that if you're someone that is very comfortable with four to 500 page books, this is definitely something you should pick up. One of the only downfalls I can think is that the fact that it is so many people's favourites, the fact that it is quite hyped, I mean, very hyped. <laughs> The fact that this book is so hyped may leave you a little bit disappointed, which I hope it doesn't because it is a really, really good and well written horror novel. However, things do tend to fall a bit short when they get super hyped. So that's the only thing that I would say. Now we are going to move on to one of my personal favourites. The only reason that I'm including this book in this list is because it is the one that I started with and I absolutely fell in love with King's writing after reading this book. I'm fully aware that most people do not say to start with this book because one, <laughs> it is massive and due to the fact that it is quite long, some people think it's a bit long-winded, that you might get a bit bored throughout it. I didn't. I've actually read it twice so far and I just really enjoyed it. And the book that I'm talking about is It. So everyone should have heard about it, whether it's from this or the miniseries from the 90s, or if it's from the more recent films in 2017 and 2019. I would recommend it to be the first Stephen King book you read if you are very comfortable with books and really enjoy books that have lots of perspectives in them that sort of weave together. If you liked your timeline books, this is also super good. In general, if you're really comfortable with massive books, if you're someone that really enjoys a long book and enjoys getting to know characters and, and the setting, then I would definitely recommend this. As I said, not a lot of people would start off with this because it is so big. The only reason that I went with this first is because I watched the 2017 film and I absolutely loved it and therefore wanted to go and read the book. That's what I did and I absolutely loved it and it's led me to read a lot more Stephen King since then. Just in case you weren't aware of what it is about, as I said it's a dual timeline narrative so we've got one narrative which is in 1957 to 1958. We are following a group of children who have deemed themselves the Losers Club. These children are absolutely perplexed and enraged at the fact that children seemingly just disappear. Every 27 years a group of children or just random children will start disappearing and this group, the Losers Club, are really wondering why is it happening, trying to get down to the bottom of it. So we've got this kind of mystery element to it until we are introduced to the main antagonist, it. The thing that lives in the sewers in Derry where these children live and they, as I said, they, they start calling it 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 presents itself in many different ways. It actually presents itself as your worst fear. In the story, also in the films and in the miniseries, we know it as being Pennywise the Dancing Clown. However, it can have also lots of other forms. This one narrative in 1957 to 1958, they are trying to get to the bottom of this and they're trying to defeat this monstrosity, which is a uh, taking the lives of so many children. However, as you could probably imagine, it doesn't quite work out the way that they want it to. Therefore, we are also following another narrative, which is 27 years later in 1984 to 1985. The Losers Club are all grown up and they have to be, they've all gone into different areas, different places, both geographically, they've all got different jobs as well. And they are all brought back together to Derry in order to try and defeat it once and for all because once again it's rampant and it's killing loads of children and they want to defeat it so that no other child is harmed by 
it. As I said before with The Shining, once again we've got a brilliant mixture of imaginative, imagined, childlike fears. In particular, we've got clowns, we've got spiders, we've got lepers, we've got just all sorts of things that these children, werewolves and all that kind of stuff mixed into here of what these children are scared of. And then at the same time, we've got the real life horrors of in particular, we've got bullying, we've got alcoholism, we've got abuse, we've got so many different things that obviously, I will say there's a lot of trigger warnings for this book, I'm not going to name them all, because personally, I do not get super affected by a lot of things, so therefore I usually do not want to know trigger warnings in advance. But if you're someone that can be affected by things like the stuff that I've just mentioned then definitely go and look it up before you read it. I would just say that that's the thing with all of Stephen King's works, just assume that there might be something that will trigger you. All those things mixed together make it seem, obviously we're dealing with something super unrealistic but at the same time it just grounds it a bit because we've got that realistic horror element to it. Once again children's perspectives absolutely wonderfully written. The This group of children is a group that will not leave you. Honestly, I still think about these children. They've all got such vivid personalities. I can remember all of them. It's one of the best group of children, like friendship groups that I've ever read in a book. In regards to this being the first book that you might read from Stephen King, there's a lot of cons. One, it's obviously very big. As I said before, because it's so long, there's a lot of description in it. If you're not that into really descriptive books, then I wouldn't recommend this as being your first one. As I said before, there's quite a few trigger warnings, actually quite a lot of trigger warnings. And also you have to take into consideration that the timelines are in the 50s and the 80s and Stephen King tends to write a lot of language that pertains to the decades that he's writing in. So therefore you may find some slang, some vernacular, some language that does not sit comfortably with you particularly when it comes to race and sexuality and gender and things like that. So if that's something that makes you uncomfortable, just be aware of it or just don't read this book if you don't think you can stomach it. The next book I've got is one for people who aren't a massive fan of horror that would like, would prefer to read a completely different genre. I would say this book is very different genre wise for Stephen King because it features a bit of a sci-fi element as well as some historical fiction. It's not, it can't really be classified as being horror as such, although it still has the normal Stephen King grittiness, real day horror. It's not actually outwardly horrifying. And that is 112263. Once again, this is quite a big book, not quite as big as it. I believe this is about 700 pages. So if you, once again, are comfortable with big books, this is definitely one that you should start with. As I said, if you are more into sci-fi, this isn't very sci-fi-y, it's more, <laughs> It's more just time travel, so if you enjoy a time travel novel, it's also very heavily like a historical fiction novel, so if that's the kind of thing that you enjoy, but you still want to try and read some of Stephen King's writing, then I would definitely go for this. At the beginning of this novel, we meet Jake Epping, who is a high school English teacher in 2011, and he is essentially sent on a time travel mission to go and stop the assassination of JFK, which as you can imagine is a difficult task but he decides to take it upon him to go back and try and stop this in order to change history. In the 1950s, once he's travelled back in time, he meets a lot of different people, he starts to experience things, he starts to assimilate into this time period, starts to be able to really picture himself living there for the rest of his life, which obviously gives him a bit of a dilemma of should he just carry on the way he is and try and like just live his life the way he wants to or should he continue with this mission that he has taken upon himself. Along the way he also tries to complete other little missions, there's certain parts of history that he tries to change that don't have a very cultural or worldwide impact but have had a big impact on, on himself or on people that he knows. 
so therefore you also try to change some other things. Perfect for someone who doesn't really like horror but still wants to read something by Stephen King. I also feel like this is one of his more sensitive books. Don't get me wrong, he still uses certain vernacular, certain words that aren't the most comfortable and it definitely, it still reads as a Stephen King novel, however it is in some ways more sensitive while still keeping his normal grit. It's one of his newer releases in comparison to like how long he's been writing for, so therefore it's not as weird and messed up as some of his older stuff. I mean in particular something like Cujo, which is about a rampant dog. It's like a massive Saint Bernard that's trying to kill people. Um, <laughs> Some of his older stuff feels a bit odd, like it's a very like weird concept, whereas this is, even though obviously it's not like something that happens every day, like people aren't just time travelling and everything, it's not super realistic, it feels more within the, the realm of what someone could naturally sort of come up with. I will say the whole time travel thing, going back in time in order to stop or change world history is not like super super unique I feel like it's something that's been is a trope that's been used before however it's still really enjoyable King puts his twist on it so if you're looking for something super unique go for one of his older works if you're looking just to get that sort of classic mixture of, of genres which Stephen King has then this is a very good one and now I'm on to the last book in this video and that is going to be if you like thrillers. If you're usually a thriller or like a suspense horror kind of person then I would recommend Misery. This is such a great book. There's so much you can talk about with this. This book follows Paul Sheldon who is a best-selling author. He is particularly well known for his series featuring uh, the eponymous character Misery Chastain. The problem is that in his most recent book he has actually killed off Misery which someone <laughs> is not particularly happy about. So that's where we meet Annie Wilkes who is very annoyed, <laughs> very infuriated that Paul Sheldon has killed off this character because she loves Misery so much and she's just very angry at him so therefore she decides to kidnap him and to hold him hostage until he writes another book in which Misery isn't dead in whichever way he interprets that. However, the problem is that this book has to be written to perfection. This has to be the perfect book for Annie, otherwise she will not let him go. This is more of like a suspense. This is more of a mental horror. There's definitely still physical elements. Um, he goes through a lot of torture and pain. However, there's a good, strong connection between the physical pain and the mental instability and mental pain that he goes through, which is a really interesting aspect. Our main antagonist, Annie, is completely nuts. She's a caricature of a crazy fangirl. It's just the fangirl persona taken to the absolute extreme. She's a really interesting character to read about. She is absolutely nuts. So if you like crazy characters, then this is the one for you. There's also an interesting play on dynamics. Usually celebrities, which you could sort of class a well-known author as being a celebrity, they usually have the upper hand. They're usually the one in a position of power over their fans. Whether that's a good thing or not, I'm not going to discuss. <laughs> However, that is usually the case. But in this book, we're obviously following this dynamic shift where it's now Annie who is the fan who is actually who actually has control over Paul Sheldon, which is a really interesting play on dynamics and power and things like that. It's really interesting to see the person who would usually be a lower end of the power spectrum now being the one with all the power. And then the final thing I'll say about this book is it's not super, super scary. It's not like supernatural scary. However, it is very creepy lots of suspense and scary in the sense that this woman is nuts. <laughs> that was the last book that I thought I would mention in this video and they were all the books that I wanted to talk about. If you haven't seen any of my recent videos then they will be linked down below. Obviously if you're new to my channel please subscribe, it would be an honour if you would do so because it helps me a lot, it makes me very happy 
and give this video a like and also follow me on Instagram and I've also got my Goodreads link down below along with that. I hope you enjoyed this video and I will see you in my next one.